Welcome to the summer 2022 breakout session. I'm Patrick Madrid, and for about the last, I don't know, 25 years, I've been doing the, almost every summer I do a workshop called Stump the Apologist. Not Stumpy the Apologist, not Stop the Apologist, but Stump the Apologist. And the idea is that we'll have a freewheeling Q&A session. I'll take your comments and questions on any topic. If you want to make a comment, that's fine and I'll comment on your comment. Um, we'll try to get through as many questions as we have time for, but the audience being the size that it is right now, I have a feeling we'll be able to maybe even go back for seconds for those of you who want to do that. And I'm just delighted that we're not in the tent because normally they have me in the tent and sometimes, as you know, when I'm very hot and humid here in, in uh, Steubenville, so it's nice to be in air conditioned comfort. So we'll just open it up to your hands. Just, yes, sir. Thank you, Gloria, for those Work. Now, inevitably, I should have down because I had to work. But, uh, but, but I I, I, it seems like every time you explain to somebody Metroidia and you're pointing out how Metroidia, they always like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it'll be a fool. Oh, okay. And it's not like I'm for it or against it, right? but I have a pastor who's very impressed with his ministry from it, and he's very well thought and very faithful. So I would appreciate any comments that you have on Sure, yeah. I mean, so what I'm going to share now are my own um, my own perceptions, my own opinions, if that's what you want to call it. So they don't really mean anything to anyone except for me, but I'll share with you my stance on the topic. So I'll begin by saying I've never been to Medjugorje, and although I consider myself an open-minded skeptic, um, there have been many people over the years who have said, well, you can't, you can't know, you've never been there, there's no way you could know. Well, that's true, but there are plenty of other places that I haven't been, but I can have an opinion on that. And what about all the people who have not been to Medjugorje and who do have a favorable opinion of it? So the idea of going or not going in itself, um, I don't have the benefit of being able to draw upon that. But by way of background, my aunt and uncle, these actually were my godparents, my, my, father's, young, my father's sister and her husband. In about 1983, they came over to my parents' house, and my wife and I were there visiting. And they said, we just came back from this amazing place in, at the time, Yugoslavia, Medjugorje. My uncle called it Medjugorje for the longest time. And, and I had never heard of anything about it. And they said, we just went on, on a pilgrimage, and it was really amazing. Our ladies appearing there. So I was like, all ears, and I'd like, I like to know. So tell me everything you know. And they wound up making maybe, I don't know, 60, 70 pilgrimages there, and they led groups to Medjugorje, so they were deeply, deeply involved, and they, they were very, very um, familiar with the seers and the messages and all of that. So that was my first exposure. It was probably more than, <coughs> more than a year or two after these alleged apparitions began. Um, and I didn't really give it a lot of thought, but as time went on, um, I, I wanted to read more, so Wayne Weibel had a book that, that he came out with, I got that, um, and a few other books just trying to make sense out of it. But I, I would run into things that didn't make sense. So there were aspects of it, especially like when the Sears went on EWTN and were doing interviews and things. And I, I won't bore you with like a laundry list, but there were things that just didn't, didn't seem quite right, and I wasn't sure why. So um, after more time went by, I began to get a sense of kind of skepticism. Like, I'm not really sure what to make of this. That's probably how I would describe myself now. I'm more than open to being wrong. I'm more than open to finding out that if this is really our lady appearing, that's great. You know, we need more of that, not less of it. Um, but things like um, a seer doing a conference in Northern California and uh, telling a blasphemous joke about uh, Jesus not being able to walk on water because he had holes in his feet. Um, right. And stuff like that, it's like, I can't picture Sister Lucia or Sita from Fatima doing something like that. Um, there is also the concern about what seemed to be sort of fame and, and kind of selling the apparitions that I felt funny about seems like most of the other apparition seers, they would go into a convent where they would lead lives of humble obscurity, but it didn't seem like that's what was going on here. 
So for all those reasons and a few others that you know are sort of back in here or there, that's my stance. I'm just sort of I'm an open-minded skeptic. I'd love to be wrong. I hope I'm wrong, um, but I'm content to just kind of take a take a wait and see approach to it. Yes, sir. Oh, you don't have to. No. I'll scan. You guys can all say. <laughs> First, I'm a, I made a, this contract for a transfer, but I came into the Catholic Church in Protestant World Pastor three weeks ago. Okay, two weeks ago. Welcome home. And you were part of that, so I'm going to thank you for your influence in my life and my, my journey. Um, so, this is Friendly Fire, which sure. is, uh, I think, a pretty good tough question. Um, uh, Pope Pilate was this uh, papal bull, human sanctum in the 14th century. They go from that sort of ambiguous declaration that there is no salvation outside the church. Right. It's necessary for salvation there to increase the subject of the Roman Pontiff. And of course, this was echoed two years later in the Council of Trent Warren. And they have long with nothing was pretty much covered. By the way, I have to repeat the questions for the, for the recording, so don't make it too long. Okay. Because I'll never remember all of it. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, if you could summarize it, then I'll try to. Much of that does it cover basically yeah. all the Protestant churches, most of those ten times over, as far as being outside of the church. And yet, um, Vatican II, uh, the decree of ecumenesis in chapter three, basically reverses all that and uses some very delicate language that basically leaves the world wide open. So for a lot of Protestants, this looks like. Moving the goalposts. You know, you're conforming to the times and seasons. It was once bad, it's now okay. Who responds? Okay, so the gentleman's question has to do with extra ecclesia nulla salus, the Latin phrase for there's no salvation outside the church, referencing a uh, papal document that declares this dogmatically that there's no salvation outside the Catholic Church. And then um, and other uh, magisterial comments to that effect. And then juxtaposing that with section three of the Vatican II document on religious liberty and ecumenism. And it seems to be an about face of a, an exact opposite approach to the topic in Vatican II compared to the earlier papal comments. So how do we square that circle? How do we, how do we make that work? Well, I would begin by saying, first of all, I adhere to the dogma of no salvation outside the church. It's a defining dogma of the faith. Every Catholic is obliged to believe that. And I do, firmly. Um, I would take my cue from section 14 of Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution of the church. And that carries more weight. It's, it's, it's more weighty as a doctrinal statement than um, a document that is giving sort of an outlook, so to speak, without teaching dogmatically certain things <laughs> as the decree on ecumenism is. So I would say we should look at section 14 of the Magentium, which says, and forgive me for not being able to quote it verbatim, but this is a pretty close approximation, that no one knowing that, first of all, it talks about Jesus Christ being our unique soul savior. There is no other savior other than Jesus. He is our savior and only him. And there, therefore, no one who knows that the Catholic Church is necessary for salvation and either refuses to enter it or to remain in it can be saved. That's a rather clunky way of saying no salvation inside the church, but it does say it very clearly. Now, the key to that passage, if you ask me, is the word knowing. So that is where it gets into the question of invincible and invincible ignorance. So the church has always held the view, even prior to um, some of these papal statements on the salvation outside the church, that there are people who, through no fault of their own, don't know. And that's always been a question mark. Well, what happens to the unborn baby who dies in the womb, or an unbaptized infant, or what happens to somebody who is mentally retarded and doesn't have the capacity to make a decision, as our Protestant friends would say, make a decision for Christ. So I would say that the, the way to harmonize, I'll, I'll come back to the decree on humanism, the way to harmonize this question about what about people who don't know would be in 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, where it says that God wills the salvation of all men. He wills them to come to knowledge of the truth and to be saved. So I believe the church's teaching alongside extra ecclesia is 
that God desires the salvation of all people. Therefore, there must be some way that at least it's possible that all people could be saved. All people, not just you know, card-carrying Catholics in the United States, but people who lived many, many centuries ago or even millennia ago and had never had time or opportunity to know about Jesus. There must be some way that the Lord would provide for them, and that has not been revealed to us. What has been revealed to us is that Jesus Christ started a church and all of life's to enter into it. So the church in, in the, that document, in section 14, I believe is saying is that if you know, or even if you suspect that the Catholic Church is necessary for salvation, you don't enter into it, or if you're a Catholic and you don't remain in the church, then you will be lost. Now, it leaves open the question, or it doesn't answer the question in the document, well, what about those souls who never had a chance and it wasn't their own fault? So to that, I would just simply say, to say that we trust in the Lord's mercy and love is not incompatible with the dogma of no salvation outside the church. It's compatible. The church has never really defined any dogma about that, so we just simply accept that on faith. Now, as for the decree itself, as you probably are well aware, uh, there was a great inroad that was made into the, the schemas of the Second Vatican Council by very liberal and modernist uh, architects of uh, an approach to these topics that is inconsistent with traditional Catholic teaching. So I don't deny that there are their fingerprints and even perhaps some phraseologies that make it that much more difficult. But in the end, the dogmatic constitution on the church, I would say, trumps the decree on ecumenism. And it clearly does say you can't be saved if you're not a member of the church. As a <coughs> so that's how I have peace and equilibrium with the issue. Um, I suppose there's much more that could be said. Does that satisfy the question? That's good. Just one more follow up. Knowingly uh, rejecting the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Where does that lead? I know you don't know, but if you were betting that. Oh, so would I guess that he's in hell? Um, I would guess that he's probably in hell, unless he had a deathbed conversion. But there's no evidence of that, uh, that I know of anyway. So assuming that there was no true conversion of heart and a repentance for the sins that he had committed, then I can't imagine that he would go to hell. Um, I, I just, it's completely against everything that Jesus said. Jesus said, he who endures to the end will be saved. Martin Luther did not endure to the end. So I hope he made it to the very last minute, but I don't expect to see Martin Luther in heaven. I'd like to be wrong. Like, like the other issue, I'd like to be wrong about that. I don't, certainly don't mean to be Mr. Doom and Gloom. The other thing that I would add to it, Jesus said, the road is wide and well-traveled that leads to perdition, to hell, and the gate is narrow, and few find it that leads to eternal life. So even from our Lord himself, it seems as though there's a sort of, it's weighted more in the pessimistic direction. But again, just my, my perceptions on that topic. Thank you. Now let's get to some hard questions. <laughs> yes. It's not for me, it's for my son. He has to do this a long time ago. I'll just hold the mic up to you so I won't have to repeat it. How about that? If eating meat was the result, if eating meat was the result of Adam and Eve's fall, how did Jesus eat meat? How did he participate in something, even if it was traditional at the time, that stemmed from the fall? Okay. Oh, that's a very interesting question. I don't think I've ever even heard that question before. So let me think it through. So if eating meat is the result of the fall of Adam and Eve, we know that God made clothing out of animal skins for them which means that animals had to die for that to take place. It doesn't say that they ate the animals, but we know that shortly after that, eventually, they were eating animals, because the abundance of the, of the garden was no longer available to them. Uh, why would Jesus do that? Uh, I, I don't see any conflict with that, because eating animals in itself is not inherently evil. There's nothing inherently wrong with eating animals or eating plants. Um, it is. It seems to me possible that, that that human history in the garden was, you might say, perhaps exempt from natural history that had been going on maybe for many billions of years, 
and all the processes that developed and um, God creating different species at various times and you know, the old earth view. That there were obviously would have been many of them, countless animals, dinosaurs, insects, fish dying, coming and going. But the death that was talked about in Romans chapter 3 and chapter 5 is introduced by sin that was Adam and Eve. So I could see the case to be made that that death is not saying that nothing died prior to this point, but that in the garden, in this, as far as human beings and whatever animals may have been there, they did not die. Uh, that's just a theory, and I don't know. I mean, it, it could be, it could be false, but it seems like that would be one way to reconcile this. But I would respond to your son, who's a vegetarian, by saying, "Well, there's really no conflict here. Jesus wore clothing, and clothing was a result of the fall. They were naked before the fall, and." The direct result of the sin was the loss of innocence and the awareness of their own nakedness, and God made clothing for the very first time. Jesus wore clothing. Why would he do that? It's a result of the fall. Well, true, but all of everything that happened in human history is a result of the fall. So I don't see any conflict. So I would just nip it in the bud there and just say it's kind of a non-question. So you're welcome. Oh uh, yes, ma'am. Well, I have a question. Kind of a complicated question here, I'm sure how to answer it. But um, so regarding the cult, and there's all these questions about some of the things he's saying. Um, why don't we? Why don't I come to you? Because the microphone has to pick up the question, or it won't make sense to people who are listening to it. Okay. Oh. Okay. So my question is about the cult. There's lots of questions out there about some of the things he's doing and saying, okay, that there, he's not so traditional, that he wants to change things. So that makes me nervous. And then, um, like he um, reinstated a pope, not a pope, but he reinstated a bishop who was um, in trouble because of the pedophilia. And, you know, so that makes me nervous. Then the whole thing that we really have two popes today, I just, it's a question. Is, has it ever happened before? I don't think so. I would like you to. <laughs> I'm afraid if you add more to that, then I'll never, I'll never get through it all. So, uh, Pope Francis certainly is very different in his demeanor, in his manner of speaking and conveying information uh, than Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI, that's for sure. They were academics, and they were very precise and logical and orderly, and Pope Francis isn't. That's just not his style. He's, he's not an academic. Now, I don't think we can chalk it up just to that. Uh, Pope Francis is Jesuit, and the, the Jesuit order, by and large, in the last hundred years, if not more, has swung very far to the left in many areas, and I think we're seeing that reflected in many of the things that Pope Francis is saying. So what do we do with that? Um, how do we make sense of it? Well, I look at it this way. Um, first of all, we don't have two popes. There can't be two popes at any given time. There's only going to be one validly elected pope. And I don't accept the view that Pope Benedict is still really the validly elected pope. Pope Francis is an invalidly elected pope because the way Pope Benedict resigned, he didn't use the correct Latin word, munus versus uh, ministerium, which is the office versus the ministry of the office. I don't think, I think that's a dead-end street, and that, that argument does not really pan out. I don't know if that's one that you're thinking about. But no, I don't believe that Pope Benedict is the real Pope hiding in the wings um, for a variety of reasons. One of them would be that if he, if he really knew that he was the validly elected Pope, then look at the, the trauma and the the problems that he would have inflicted on the church knowingly by having somebody who, if this were true, and I don't believe it is, uh, was really an, an anti-pope. Pope, that indicts Pope Benedict. I mean, he's, a, he's a wicked scoundrel, but that's, that's really what he's doing. I don't believe that is what he's doing. He has repeated many times, I have renounced my office completely. Now, looking back on it, I really would rather that he hadn't done that, but he did that. So we just we have to roll with the punches. This is Christ's church. And one thing I can tell you, I don't know how much of a consolation this will be to you, but if you look at the 2,000-year history of the church, for the most part, we've had rather good popes, some of them very saintly, martyrs, 
some of them good, competent men who didn't necessarily rise to the level of sanctity. But we also had a few terrible, evil popes who committed murder and who fathered all sorts of illegitimate children and carried on in who knows what different ways, buying and selling offices. Uh, some of these popes were wickedly corrupt, and none of those things appear to be any problems that we might see uh, with Pope Francis. I've never seen any evidence of that. So I offer you that by way of comparison to say, in the history of the church, we have seen some really terrible popes. So by comparison, even though it's jarring, and some of the things that Pope Francis says and does are, are, can be indeed very jarring, even to the point of saying, well, how do we square this with what we know to be true? Um, another point of refuge, if we can call it that, is that when the First Vatican Council defined the dogma of papal infallibility, it was very specific about when the Pope enjoys the special charism of infallibility, and it gives an example of when he formally or um, in an extraordinary way is going to define a dogma. Um, Pope Francis's comments on planes, who am I to judge, um, Catholics don't have to breathe like rabbits, uh, all the <laughs> things like that, none of those things fall within the parameters that are set by the church as far as the charism of infallibility is concerned. None of them do. So what that tells me is, all right, Lord, if in the course of your church's history, if you've seen fit to permit some popes to come and go who did not do as good of a job or as clear of a job, or maybe they made a bit of a mess of things, um, and we've seen that before, well, Lord, I trust you. I trust you. And you said that on this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I believe that. So it's easy to believe the Lord when everything is calm and seems easy to, to figure out. It's much more difficult to trust the Lord when you're in the fishing boat, as the apostles were on the Sea of Galilee, when this huge storm came up, and it looked like they were going to drown because of the waves being so high, and Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat, as you know. And they would shake him awake, Lord, don't you care that we're about to, to die? And Jesus says, you know the story, he says, why did you doubt Oh, you have little faith? And then he calms the storm. He had been there in the boat the whole time, the apostles were freaking out. And so personally, I look to that story in Scripture as a reminder to me that I have to trust, and I do trust. And I'm not going to try to, you know, figure out some fantastical theory about how Pope Benedict is the real Pope or anything like that. I'm just going to trust and go forward. And, and I'll add this, and I pray every day that, that God will help Pope Francis to be the very best Pope he's capable of being. Give him courage of conviction, give him the, the light of intellectual truth to know what needs to be done, so that he, he can be a very good Pope. And I pray that in God's providence that's what happens. In the meantime, I'm just going to trust in Jesus, and I know the faith, I know what Jesus taught, I know what the Bible teaches, what the traditional church's teachings are, and I'm okay to just press on that way. That's a question that does come up more than more than a few times on the radio program. So I've just given you a rendition of the answer I've given before. Yes, sir. Um, how do we? Uh, how, when, and where did Mary pass away? And how do we know for sure that she was assumed into heaven? Okay. With your permission, if you answer that, yeah. I'll follow. Okay, certainly. So the gentleman's question is, how, when, and where did Mary die, and how do we know that she died, and was more importantly bodily assumed in heaven? And then there's a follow-up coming after that. Well, we don't have any explicit scriptural testimony that tells us that Mary was assumed bodily into heaven. Uh, we can infer implicitly a few things, because, for example, we know that other people were assumed bodily into the heavens, like Elijah. So at the end of his earthly life, he was somehow transformed, went up in this fiery chariot, and Elisha saw him go up into the heavens. He didn't go to heaven because the gates of heaven were closed at that point. But he was translated somehow into eternity. And so we know that is true. We know that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that there will be a rapture at the very end when the final trumpet blows, as Steve Ray was talking about. And those who are left alive on the earth will be raptured up and caught up into the air and transformed somehow into eternity. So we know that bodily assumptions are biblical. There's, there's no question mark on that point. 
The question is, does the Bible say anything specific about Mary being bodily assumed? The answer is no. We could look at Revelation chapter 12, um, verse 1. And then I saw a great sign in the sky, a woman clothed with the sun, and on her head a crown of 12 stars, standing on the moon. And this, of course, is an image of the Blessed Virgin Mary. There are other senses of scripture that one can see there. This woman can also represent Israel, for example. But the male son born to this woman is clearly Jesus Christ. So the literal meaning of that passage, Revelation 12, 1 and forward, is Jesus literally. So the literal interpretation of the woman would be Mary. So some church fathers have pointed to that to say there's an allusion to the assumption that she's seen in heaven, but it doesn't say bodily assumed or anything like that. So how do we know? We know from what, what is called uh, apostolic tradition, which is the oral transmission of the faith. It's not reduced to scripture, it's not contained in scripture. And the oral tradition of the church, going back as far as we have records, uh, indicates that Mary was bodily assumed into heaven when she, uh, she was elderly. She had lived for a time in Ephesus, in Turkey, with St. John. And then near the end of her life, the story is that she went back to Jerusalem and the other, the other apostles, including St. John, they all gathered in Jerusalem to be with her when she died. And they were there with her when she died. And they went back the following morning and her body was gone. It was filled with roses. And if you ever go to Jerusalem, you can actually see the chapel that's dedicated. And they say that this slab is the place where her body lay. So we don't know from that standpoint. But the church, by formally defining this as a dogma, was drawing upon the firm apostolic tradition. Now, in the earliest centuries of the church, there's no mention of this, but there's a good reason for that. So in the first, say, 200, 250 years, the reason we don't see anything in written form about this is for the same reason that we don't see anything written about the Trinity or anything written about the hypostatic union of Jesus because the church was fighting for its very life under persecutions. It was living underground did have the luxury to be able to develop some of these theological truths. But as soon as the persecutions ended in the early fourth century with the coming of Emperor Constantine, that's when you begin to see the sort of explosion of literature talking about Our Lady being Father assumed to heaven. So we can make a reasonable case that this was a truth in apostolic tradition that had been handed down, but nobody had had a chance to really write about it until that time. So what was your follow-up question? Uh, well, just to expand just one quick second. Sure. We really don't have any record of how long Mary lived after the death of Jesus, do we? No, we don't. We have uh, what are what I would call solely um, private revelation with people such as uh, Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, who does give some very precise details, and she does, in fact, I think she even goes so far as to say how old Our Lady was when she died. But those details are apocryphal. They could all be true, but the church doesn't say that anyone has to believe any of that stuff. One interesting point, though, was that Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, she, in these visions, she saw this house that St. John and Our Lady lived in, in Ephesus, and she knew exactly where it was, and she described how the road up from Jerusalem, going into what is now Turkey, and then you go this way, and you go that way, and the house is, is there. Well, some explorers, having read that, they thought, well, let's test this. So they followed the, the information that she had given in these ecstatic visions that she had, and they found it. They found this house that was, it was a stone house. Some of you may have been there, the house of Our Lady in Ephesus. And it was completely obscured by branches and, and trees and plants. So nobody even really knew it was there anymore. And they discovered it, and all of her details about this house that she had given years before were exactly as described. So not that that proves anything, but it is an interesting, you know, little tidbit that maybe her information about Our Lady, how old she was, uh, that could be could be true. But the church does not say that we have to believe any of that. And you started to speak about my follow-up, which was Elijah. You know, I was going to say, you know, when Mary had uh, been assumed to heaven. And then she came back and appears, and she's kind of working in heaven, where we hear about Elijah who was brought up to heaven, and we don't hear about him as well. So what would be the significance of Elijah being assumed to heaven? There isn't I don't know that 
I have an answer to that off the top. I would have to read a Scott Hahn book to tell you <laughs> to answer that question. Um, Scott, so knowledgeable in such matters, I'm sure he could give you some really scintillating reason. I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, if nothing else, I would guess that that was a way of God showing his favor to Elijah as the premier prophet. Moses and Elijah appearing with Jesus on Mount Tabor, symbolizing and personifying the law and the prophets. So Elijah personified all of the prophets in himself. Moses symbolizes in himself the law. And the two together on the Mount of Transfiguration are, you might say, sort of like God's stamp of approval that my beloved son, listen to him, he now is fulfilling everything that came before. So if I had to guess, I would say that the Lord giving Elijah this special privilege of going up in this chariot was a way to show his favor on Elijah. But I bet Scott's got a better answer than that. So, yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, the Blessed Mother, I understand, she, when she was conceived, it was without original sin. Just I'm not talking about that. No, it's just I'm sorry. sorry. Um, Mary was conceived without original sin. Both her parents, the original sin was removed before the sperm and the egg met. Then, um, Mary has always been spoken of as being a virgin. So when she conceived, she conceived from the Holy Spirit. When Christ was born, in order for Mary to be a virgin, then she had to have just, Christ has, and even as an infant, just had to come out of her stomach, her abdomen, or somewhere. But she, he didn't come down through the birth tract. Is that correct? Good question. Um, at first, I thought you were going in the direction of Mary's sinlessness, but you're talking more about Our Lady's being a perpetual virgin. Okay, got it. We, and, and, I, and I think for obvious reasons, when you think about it, the gynecological details of this aspect of our Lord's life and coming into um, the manger are just not revealed to us. We just, God did not tell us that. And I don't know that we need to know that personally. I mean, we can speculate. But the commentators, the church fathers, for example, who comment on this, not all of them did, but some of those who comment on it, they say, that on the one hand, of course, Our Lady was not subject to the penalties of the fall, one of which was pain of childbirth, and uh, that was told by God to Eve in Genesis 3. So Mary was not subject to that. She didn't have to have pain of childbirth, but normal childbirth involves pain, as you don't need me to tell you ladies, you already know that. So the commentators say that it's possible that one of two things took place. One is, that Our Lady had a normal, regular birth, the way any mother would give birth to a child vaginally. We're not talking about a cesarean, because those didn't exist then. Um, and that, the miracle of that was that the Lord passing through the birth canal did not violate the integrity of Mary's anatomy. I'm speaking in roundabout terms here. So we're talking about Our Lady, after all. So that's a possibility. The Lord could easily have enabled that birth to take place that way without any change whatsoever to Our Lady's physical integrity. But that's assuming that virgin or virginity is referring only to that, and it's not. It, it does refer to that, but I'd say more in a limited way, but it's more importantly, it's referring to the means of procreation, that Our Lady was a virgin and never <coughs> experienced that. It's, this is a, the, a gift of the Holy Spirit that conceived the Lord inside her. So that when the church says that Mary was ever virgin, it's, I think, more so emphasizing that point than the anatomical issue. But I think that's so too. The other school of thought is that the miracle was that the Lord passed through a lady's body in a way like a ray of light passes through a pane of glass. It goes through it, it doesn't change it, it doesn't break it, it's a miracle. 
That's possible too. So personally, I'm content to say one or the other happened. I don't know. I don't feel like I need to know. And in heaven, if the Lord reveals that to his saints in heaven, they will know. But in the meantime, we can still say with certainty that Our Lady remained a virgin before, during, and after the birth of Jesus. Does that get to your question? Yes. Okay. I, I agree with your second. That's what I think. Yeah. Because after all, he was God. He was God that loved all of us. Well, we have to remember that, that that is certainly possible. It could have happened that way. But other things that didn't have to happen did happen. So, like, our Lord didn't need to be circumcised. He didn't need to shed his blood. He didn't need to go through that. But he did do that as a way to fulfill prophecy and to enter into our human sufferings as he did. So, um, at the basically, for, for the moment, I guess what we can say is we know something miraculous happened. We just don't know exactly what it was. Yes? So, would you address the Immaculate Conception? Sure. The Immaculate Conception, first of all, is that Our Lady was preserved free from all sin from the moment of her conception. And that is understood in two ways. One is that she never contracted the condition of original sin, which is inherited from Adam and Eve. And she also never fell into any sin of her own. So she never committed any act against the will of God. And so those two go together. Um, the best way that I know to establish this fact biblically would be to use a typological argument, and I'll give you a quick overview of it. I wrote an article on the topic about 30 years ago. It's called Mary Ark of the New Covenant. And if you go to my website, patrickmcgrid.com, look at articles. It's there as a PDF, and you can print it out. It gives you far more biblical information that I can give you right now, but I'll give you a little smattering of it. The typological argument is rampant throughout the New Testament, that in the Old Testament, there were persons, places, or things that foreshadowed or pointed toward or symbolized something that would come in the New Testament. Most of them have to do with Jesus. So Moses was a type of Jesus. Moses led the people out of bondage of sin in Egypt, down through the Red Sea, and eventually to the Promised Land, feeding them with manna in the desert, etc. So he was a prefigurement of Jesus who rescues us from bondage to slavery in sin. Um, Adam is a type of Jesus. St. Paul talks about that in Romans, where he talks about the first Adam is the one who caused the catastrophe with sin. The second Adam, being Jesus, is the one who corrects the, the <coughs> fall, or the results of the fall from the first Adam. The man in the desert is a type of the Holy Eucharist. Um, the Paschal Lamb on the night of Passover was a type of Jesus slain for our salvation and eat, consuming him in the Mass in the Holy Eucharist. So there's a half a dozen examples right there. I think just to establish the fact that this is a very common biblical archetype. archetype. The thing that you'll notice is that in typology, the type or the Old Testament figure or person is always inferior and imperfect. The fulfillment of the type or the antitype, as it's called in theological circles, is always perfect and complete. And this is an important point because now we'll look at a few types that point to Mary. So the first immaculate conception, of course, was Adam, followed by Eve. They were created immaculate, free from sin. Now, they didn't come into existence the way babies do now. God made them in a different fashion. But nonetheless, he made them immaculate, free from sin. And one of the patristic comments is that he made Adam, as we're told, from this immaculate material, cosmos, before the fall, was not labored by sin. It was not corrupted by sin. And therefore, in a sense, if you want to talk about Mother Earth, but not in a tree-hugging way, the, the mother, so to speak, of Adam was this primordial good material that was spotless. It was not corrupted by sin. Now. The, the mother of the second Adam, Mary, if the typology is correct, would say that this, of course, was a, a limited kind of connection because it's, it's just dirt or whatever God used. But here we have a woman. So Mary, this argument goes, would be more perfect and complete in the sense of being immaculate. The second example would be of Eve herself. So as we know, Eve was created immaculately, but she fell and then in the Proto-Evangelion, the, the, the Proto-Gospel in Genesis 3.15, where God says, 
you know, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the cattle and all the other beasts, and you'll have to crawl on your belly, talking about talking to the, the serpent. And he says to the woman, he says, I will put, he says to the, to the devil, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and you will strike it, his heel, and he will crush your head. Now, St. Jerome, later on, in translating the Bible into Latin, he drew out the Marian type here, the Marian archetype, that Eve, the first woman, who was created sinless and yet fell into sin, she was the mother of the human race. Well, Jesus, the second Adam, his mother would be created free from sin and did not fall. So she was preserved in grace. Um, and the third one would be the Ark of the Covenant. Now, I find this particularly dramatic because the parallels are so close, but the Ark of the Covenant was this container, probably, as I would guess, maybe about the size of the table that Ty was sitting at right now. It'd be a box, about four, four feet wide, maybe, about so tall. And it had strict dimensions that are given by God in Exodus chapters 25 through 30, and then they're repeated in Exodus 25, 35 through 40. And there we see God telling Moses to create this container that would house within it the Word of God in Scripture. Now, that would be the Ten Commandments, the very beginning of the Word of God in Scripture. That reposed in the ark, as well as some manna from the desert that was kept in a jar in the ark. Now, the ark had to be made as perfect as possible, so out of the finest wood, acacia wood, out of uh, covered with beaten gold, surmounted by angels, statues of cherubim that would sit on top, all of which pointed to the excellence and the perfection, as far as humanly possible, of this art. Well, obviously you can't make it perfect in every detail because it's human craftsmanship. So the patristic argument is that just as the art which carried the word of God in Scripture in it was holy, the Word of God in flesh was in the Ark of the New Covenant, the Blessed Virgin Mary. But, wait, there's more. So, when, when the Ark was completed, and you read this in Exodus 35 through 40, when the Ark was completed, we see that the, the Spirit of God, the presence of God, overshadowed the Ark and filled the Ark with the presence of the Lord, which, of course, is redolent of what the angel Gabriel said in Luke chapter 1, that the Holy Spirit will overshadow you and, the whole, and God's Spirit will come upon you. And this is how God literally was present inside the Blessed Virgin Mary in the Incarnation. But wait, there's more. So the Ark was the holiest artifact in the people of Israel, and it was captured in battle. You can read about this in 2 Samuel chapter 6. It was captured by the Philistines. So King David rallies the troops. They go back into battle. They recapture the Ark. And as it's being brought back into the city of David, just read the whole chapter of 2 Samuel 6, it says that King David leaped for joy before the ark of the Lord. And he said, who am I that the ark of the Lord should come to me? And then he diverted the ark into the hill country of Judea, and he, they were told the name of the family, embedded on the Gittite. And while the ark was present there at that man's home, it blessed his family, and that's a euphemism for the women got pregnant, the animals got pregnant, the crops were bountiful. So life was bestowed upon this family as a result of the presence of the ark. Well, the parallels here are startling with Luke chapter 1 because Our Lady gets up in haste and goes to where? The hill country of Judea, to the home of Elizabeth and Zechariah, who had just been blessed with life in their old age. And Elizabeth sees Mary and says, Who am I that the ark of the Lord should come to me? And we know that the baby in her womb leaped for joy, as King David did when he leaped for joy in the presence of the ark. So these are all, and I forgot who asked me the question. You guessed me first. These are all aspects of the typological argument that holds that, if we wanted to talk biblically about it, that Mary fulfills the biblical typology of these different things. And because those things are imperfect and partial in the Old Testament, she would be perfect and complete in the New Testament. One last uh, little snippet here. At the end of Revelation chapter 11, St. John says, Then I saw the temple in heaven open, the sanctuary in heaven open, and I saw the Ark of the Covenant. And there was a great earthquake, and there was hail and thunder and peals of lightning. The very next sentence is Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, where he says, 
And then I saw a great sign in the sky, a woman clothed with the sun. So he brings together, yet again, this arc Mary motif. Um, we have to rely upon, if we want to give a biblical defense of Our Lady's um, sinlessness, we have to rely upon these implicit arguments because there is nothing explicit there that says that Mary was sinless. So the church fathers and later doctors of the church, they rely upon that as their biblical foundation. Oh, I, my hobby is internet apologetics. Okay. Um, if you're speaking to somebody who's open and really wants an answer, all of that can be compelling. Yeah. I usually face people who are attacking the church, don't want to hear anything, but give me the verse, give me the chapter, and that's all I want to hear. I'll tell you how to handle that. That's a, that's a different argument, but it's related. You just If somebody says, unless you can show me the Bible where it says that Mary was sinless, I'm not going to believe it. What I would say is, oh, are you saying that you will only accept a doctrine if it's found in the Bible? And if somebody asserts a doctrine and you can't find it in the Bible, that you shouldn't believe it? He's going to say, yes, that's exactly what I mean. So then what you should do is to say, oh, well, then show me where that doctrine is found in the Bible. Where does the Bible say I have to prove anything for the Bible? And the answer is nowhere. This is something Catholics need to know. If you ever find yourself on defense, on, on the defensive, and somebody is saying, show it to me in the Bible, show it to me in the Bible. What you can do is to say, show me where the Bible says I have to. And it doesn't. Because this is a, it is a presupposition that's brought to the discussion that is actually nowhere taught in the Bible. Um, it is great and important whenever you can use scripture, but it's not always possible. So in this case, uh, I would turn it back around that way. And I would say, if you can't show me where the Bible says, I have to prove this to you from the Bible, then I am under no obligation to have to prove it to you from the Bible, and, and it still be true. So, yes? It seems that Catholicism is reducing the popularity of the United States, yet in a country like Africa, from what we've read, it's really catching on. Could you give us some input as to why you feel that might be factual? Yeah, I'm, I've never been to Africa myself, but I've heard from a lot of people that the faith is really expanding there. Lots of priestly locations, lots of religious sisters, big families. So we should rejoice to see that kind of growth in the church. And you're right, I think in many respects the church is dying rapidly in the West. Um, why do I think this is happening? Well, I was actually talking with Scott over lunch about this very issue, and he was talking about the principle of recapitulation, where something... It's kind of another way of talking about cycles that happen in Scripture. And so we see where Israel, God's chosen people, was protected by God, but eventually because they disobeyed God and they did not walk in his statutes and ordinances, eventually God punished them by allowing them to be taken captive. And the land of Israel was depopulated in Babylonian captivity as one example. So it was a punishment to the people for their infidelity. He didn't forsake the covenant with them, but he permitted them to undergo this suffering, and a great many of them were killed as a result of that. And so in talking with Scott, what he was pointing out is this is not only a biblical pattern, it's an historical pattern. And so uh, the church was really, really strong in the Middle East for the longest time, and then came Islam. And Islam overran the Middle East, which was largely Catholic at that time, and now the Catholic Church is reduced to a very tiny minority, and it's under great stress all the time. Um, the same thing is true with the sack of Rome. So when you get to the seventh century, and the, um, the the different tribes from Eastern or Western Europe finally destroyed Rome and captured it. The Goths, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths. There were a lot of Goths back in those days, and eventually. Rome, the seat, the very capital of the church, so to speak, was depopulated. It was, it was laid waste. And so this happens in cycles, historically as well as biblically. And so the upshot, and I think the answer to your question is, it may well be that we're living in such a time where the Lord is permitting the devastation of this part of the vineyard. And it's not him devastating the vineyard, it's we who have devastated the vineyard, and not necessarily you and I personally, but as a culture, as a church, locally, we have devastated our section of the vineyard. And so it may be that the Lord is just going to allow that to happen while the vineyard thrives in some other place like Africa. So we're seeing the same devolution now in Latin America. And for 500 years, Latin America was thoroughly capital, completely capital, and now look at it. 
it too is falling apart. So that's another one of those cycles, it seems to me. I don't know if that's the answer, but I find it plausible myself. Yes, ma'am. I'm a second grade teacher, and when we, uh, at a Catholic school, and when we get up to the rosary and we learn the Apostles' Creed, every year the kids ask me, Can I guess? Why did Jesus descend to the dead? Okay. I was Is gonna that guess it? That. Yeah. There are two. Okay. That's one of them. So that was one guess. Why would Jesus go to hell? Or to hell, yes. Why did he descend into hell was the point of that. The other one that comes up all the time is, what does it mean that he rose again from the dead? Does that mean that he rose once before and that he rose again from the dead? You'd be surprised how many people trip over that as well. And that's just a figure of speech. Okay, so let's talk about that. The creed says that he descended into hell, and the Latin is inferno. Inferno. So the, the word in Latin that St. Jerome chose to translate from the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament is that Latin word. In Hebrew, it's Sheol, and in Greek, it's Hades. So I'm sort of saying it the way that an American English speaker would say those words. Those two words, Hades and Sheol, mean the underworld. It means the place of the dead. And everybody went there. So the good, the bad, and everybody went there. And we know that because Jesus himself said that in Luke 16 where he tells us about Lazarus and the rich man. And I, and I know you all know the story, but for the sake of it, let's go through it. So Lazarus and the rich man both die. Lazarus, the poor man, goes to a place of tranquility and peace with Abraham. The rich man, Divas, as he's traditionally known, which is just the Latin word for rich, he goes to a place of fiery torment. Now, when he appeals to Abraham for some help, because he sees Lazarus with Abraham, and he asks for some relief, Abraham says, no, there's a great chasm fixed between where you are and where we are. We cannot cross to where you are, and you cannot cross to where we are. But they all were in Sheol. They all were in Hades. So what happened was, when St. Jerome, in translating the Latin Vulgate, used the Latin word for hell, that was translated eventually into English. So like, say, the Douay Reims version, that's the... The, the literal translation of that word, but it, it loses the nuance of the underworld being a place for both good and bad. So, long story short, to answer your question, when Jesus descended into hell, quote-unquote, he descended into Sheol in the Hades, and he went to that place where Abraham and all the righteous of the Old Testament were waiting, Lazarus included. And so he preached to them. St. Paul talks about this in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and 2 Peter chapter 4 where he says that the gospel was preached to the dead who were in prison, and it's referring to, to them that he went to. But he certainly did not go to where the damned souls are. He did not go down into the lake of fire or anything like that. He, some Protestant preachers, I've even heard some say that Jesus had to go to hell and suffer for our sins in hell for a while. Nothing could be further from the truth. So there's a rather lengthy answer, but does that satisfy I don't know if it'll satisfy a second grader, but sure. <laughs> no. If it satisfies, you know, an adult, then it's the job of the adult to figure out a way to translate that. Yeah, thank you. Second grade piece. Yes, ma'am. I, um, I have a question. Um, like, so when you read the Apostles' Creed, you know, you have one of them mentioned the Presence. I know they were written to um, codify things that were not Right. But then I start thinking about all the prayers that we say, none of them talk about the Holy Presence. And I feel like that would definitely help our faith. It would help, you know, and I'm just curious why that is, that's never been a part of any of our prayers. It's interesting the way you phrase it, and I'm not playing gotcha, but it actually is. Okay. So in, in, yeah, in, in Matthew chapter 4, I believe it is, where the Lord gives us the, the our Father, the phrase our daily bread, that's, that's kind of a weak English translation. The meaning of the word in the Greek is super substantial. <coughs> so give us this day our super substantial bread. So I think most of the time when we say that prayer, we think about give us the necessities of life. We want to eat today. We want a roof over our heads today. But actually, it's, it's referring to the Eucharist. So Jesus is saying, give us this day this bread from heaven, this 
this bread that Jesus said, if you eat this bread, you will never die. So I would propose to you that the very prayer that Jesus gave us does talk about the Eucharist in that word. We just don't pick up on it because it's kind of insipid in English the way it's translated. Um, but yeah, so what about, why, why wouldn't they talk about the Eucharist? I mean, it's such a huge deal. And even early church fathers in the first and second century, they're talking about it. So why wouldn't it be in the creeds? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I wish that they had said more about the full divinity of Jesus Christ. I wish that they had said something more about the Trinity, and they don't say any of those things. Uh, this is why the Arian heretics and later heretics they could appeal to the Creed and they say, "Look, it just says I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, I believe in the Holy Spirit." Some of them said, "Well, Jesus isn't God. He's Jesus, but he's not God. God is like separate," and so. They misunderstood the import of the creed. It would have made my job a whole lot easier if, if they had uh, spoken a bit more about that. I wish that the, the St. Paul had said, oh, and by the way, Our Lady was assumed in heaven, and yes, you can pray to her. That would have made it so much easier for me. But um, it's one of those mysteries. When I look back and I wonder, what, what was it that they didn't think was so urgent to include that? So, yeah. Is there any chance that everything, I mean, the Catholics don't, they don't believe, right? The questions are, they don't know. Yeah. So, is it time to put it somewhere? They don't care if we say, oh, yeah. yeah, that's an interesting question. Well, the ladies uh, for, for the recording asking about because the Eucharist is not mentioned in the Apostles' Creed or in the Nicene Creed, and since many Catholics have lost their faith in the world presence now, might it not be an opportune time to add it to the Creed? Yeah, well, you know that the Eastern Orthodox folk would go wild if, if we did that. They are already angry that we put the filioque clause in there, you know, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, and that's caused over a thousand years of heartburn, you know, in that area. Um, I don't think we're likely to see that happen, um, and I'm not sure I have a good answer for that, except to say it doesn't seem like it's the kind of thing that the Church would do to change now. Maybe in an ecumenical council, there will be a new creed formulated that everyone will learn. Just like the old creeds were formulated and everybody had to learn them. And this is the creed of the faith. Um, and maybe, maybe it is time for, in another ecumenical council, some new creed that would include some of those things could be established. I would welcome that. So I guess we'll have to wait and see. Yes, there are several instances that have proven that the Blessed Sacrament is truly Christ because it has bled. There was a, a witch lady that took one of the hosts and put it in her pocket and got it out of the church. And when it started bleeding, it bled down her stove, across her. Yeah. I'm familiar with I'm familiar with it. And that one several others. You're referring to something that is absolutely bona fide truth, and that is Eucharistic miracles. And there are many, there are hundreds of them. And most people have only heard of maybe Lanciano or some of the, some of the more prominent ones. But you're right. And scientific studies on some of these uh, miraculous hosts have shown that it's human heart tissue. And interestingly enough, the blood type matches the blood type on the Shroud of Turin. That doesn't prove anything, but it is interesting. So you're right, Eucharistic miracles are a real phenomenon and they're not explainable by modern science. Is there somebody I was going to say? Yeah, this gentleman, where are you back? I had a question. When you're uh, debating somebody about Sola Scriptura and you mentioned that, you know, hey, that, that idea isn't even in the Bible, have you been able to come up with a, a list of beliefs that Protestants have that also are not in the Bible, but they believe it anyway? You could kind of rattle off a few that... Oh, okay. Well, that's one of them. Sola Scriptura, the idea of going by Scripture alone, is not in the Bible. Um, for that matter, Jesus the Apostle is the Church Fathers. They didn't teach it. It's a, sub a presupposition that arose in a systematic way at the time of the Protestant Reformation. But another good one, it, it, it's so blindingly obvious that it surprises me that more people don't see it right away, and that is the canon of Scripture. It was revealed by God that these books, these 27 books of the New Testament, are inspired. In fact, St. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God. So the church, of course, did not make these books inspired. Church men wrote them under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, 
But this is God's revelation to us, but it's also God's revelation which books are inspired. That's part of his revelation. And the interesting thing is that the Bible nowhere tells you which books belong to the Bible. So we're talking about the New Testament here. There's no inspired table of contents, as people have said before. So there's no, if you go by scripture alone, there is no way to know what scripture is. You have no way of knowing it. You have no way of knowing if Matthew is an authentic gospel because it, like the other gospels, is anonymous. It doesn't tell us who wrote it. Now, we have very good foundational evidence to know that it was written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, two apostles and two ones who came later. But the Bible doesn't furnish us with that information. So that's another tradition, sacred tradition, that is, that comes to us from God, but it comes to us through the church, not through the Bible. And if you don't accept that, as Protestants do, I mean, they're forced to do so without really realizing it, they are, in effect, they, they are accepting, they have to, this unwritten apostolic tradition that informs them which books belong in the New Testament. And so that's the irony, it seems to me, that somebody who says, I go by scripture alone, I don't accept any tradition at all, I've had to say a few times, well, in fact, you do, and then talk about the canon of scripture. I did a debate with a gentleman named James White, a uh, Calvinist, Baptist, really anti-Catholic guy. We did a debate in 1980, 19, what was it, 1993. And it was on this topic. And it's on YouTube if you want to look it up. And during the cross-examination period, this is probably my favorite moment of this debate, he says, Mr. Madrid, can you furnish us with just one example of a tradition that we as Christians, because this is at a Protestant church that we held in faith, that we as Christians are obliged to hold as necessary. Can you just give us just one? And he was expecting something about Mary or purgatory or something like that. So I, I let my Bible thump down on the table in front of him for dramatic effect. And I said, the canon of the New Testament. The canon of the New Testament. Those books are inspired by God, but you have no way of knowing that they're inspired by God going through the Bible alone. That is a tradition that you not only have to accept, but you freely do accept. So that was one of those fun moments of the debate. Yes? What impact did the Dead Sea Scrolls have? Could you repeat that, please? What impact did the Dead Sea Scrolls have? Oh, lots of impact, for sure, for a few things. So the Dead Sea Scrolls, which began to be found in the late 1940s, um, they shed light on the integrity of later Bible translations, because these were older, these fragments, and in some cases, larger, even complete books of the, of the Bible, we can now check our oldest manuscripts, which would be centuries older than these. We can check them to see, are they accurate? So there's, there's a manuscript textual comparison that scholars are, are still doing. Uh, we can also help to settle another um, polemic, and that is the seven books of the Old Testament that are rejected by Protestants, known as the, the uh, Deuterocanon, which means the second canon. The Deuterocanonical books, Protestants often call them apocryphal books. So, first and second Maccabees, Tobit, Baruch, Judith, etc. So, one of the important things is that when Martin Luther wanted to jettison those books from the Catholic Bible that had been defined by the church for well over a thousand years as being part of the canon. So he didn't like, for example, in 2 Matthew chapter 12, where it says it is a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they may be loose from their sins. I mean, that's a direct reference to purgatory. Or where it says in James chapter 2, that you see then that, man, that a man is, is justified by works and not by faith alone. What Martin Luther's whole project was that we justified by faith alone. So that wasn't one of the seven Old Testament books, but it led to a desire on the part of many Protestants to find a way to say those books don't belong in the Bible, those Old Testament books, because they were inconvenient for the novel theology that was coming out at that time. So an argument that was made was, well, look, the rabbis didn't accept them in the Palestinian canon, which was drawn up after the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. So after Israel had been laid waste again, and the Romans had destroyed the temple, profaned it, and then destroyed it. Remember Jesus said that this generation will not pass away before you see these things that are coming 
and one stone will not be left upon another. Jesus was prophesying about the destruction of Jerusalem. So there were people there who lived to see this take place. Well, in the aftermath of all that, there was a rabbinical council in Palestine that was seeking to determine which books do we regard to be inspired scripture. And so they did not include those books, seven books of the, the, the deuterocanonical books. And their argument was not because there was anything in them. Keep in mind that those books had been part of the Septuagint version of the Old Testament for 600 years. Well, 300 years at least. So the Septuagint translation into Greek of the Hebrew scriptures contained all those books. And that was never an issue. But those rabbis said, we have no evidence that these books were inspired in Hebrew, and there's no way that we could accept the idea that they would be inspired in a pagan tongue like Greek. So they only had the earliest examples they could find. Parts of Esther, for example, the second part of Esther and these books were only in Greek. Well, back to your question, the Dead Sea, the Dead sea Scrolls confirm the fact that you've got older Hebrew versions of these books. So the argument that we shouldn't accept them because they were not they were not uh, inspired in Hebrew that that was now a moot point. So that's another reason why the Dead Sea Scrolls are important. There are others, but those are two. I want to get to somebody I haven't taken yet, uh, but I will come. I will circle back. Yes, ma'am. I'll repeat it, Tony, but I have it What do you say to people who say that your personal relationship with Jesus is what saves you, not the fact that, I'll say it somewhat differently, not that you're a member of a church. Right. You have a, like a name, like Catholic or something right. else. Okay. Well, I would say that it's true, but it's not the whole truth. So your personal relationship with Jesus is indeed what saves you because you're either going to be in the state of grace in which you would be saved when you die, or you'd be in the state of mortal sin, in which case you'd be damned. But to be in a personal relationship with Jesus on his terms means to accept his teaching and to enter his church. And he said in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, the Great Commission, he said to the apostles, go into the whole world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. So Baptism, you might think of as a doorway, like it's the entrance into the church. But Jesus wants every person everywhere and all times to be in his church. So when I say we, we have to come to Jesus on his terms, what I mean by that is Jesus established the means by which he wants to have a personal relationship with us, and that is in his church with the sacraments and all those good things that he gives us. He wants us to have that. So if somebody were to say, well, you know, I just want to have like a relationship with you, Jesus, and I just want to think about you and pray about you and hear sermons about you, but I'm not interested in the things that you said that people have to do. I think that belies the, the possibility of having a real relationship with Jesus that's based on truth. So I would say yes, it does, it does, it, it does uh, flow from your relationship with him, but if you're demanding that Jesus come to you on your terms, that's not the kind of relationship that he's talking about. Remember, he, he says, um, Matthew chapter 15, um, the wise man is the one who hears these words of mine and does them. He's like a man who built his house on a rock. And the, man, the foolish man is the one who hears these words of mine and does not do them. And I think about that, or I think about what Jesus says. Why do you say to me, Lord, Lord, but you do not do what I command you? What did Jesus command us to do? Listen to the apostles. Luke 10, 16, he who listens to you, he said to the apostles, listens to me. He who rejects you, rejects me. So it seems like Jesus is giving us lots and lots and lots of reasons to say that he wants us to have a relationship with him that will save us, but he dictates the terms of the relationship. We don't. What do you think that means then for 
The Jewish people. Well, I would put it this way, and I'm just drawing upon what St. Paul himself said. So if you read uh, Romans chapter 11, for example, he talks a lot about this. Also in Galatians, he talks a lot about this. And that is that the Lord did not go back on his promise. The Lord did not forget his chosen people. He gave them everything he promised he would in Jesus. So he gave them the Messiah, the Redeemer, the Savior. He gave all of Israel everything that they had been hoping for and waiting for. They're the ones who refused to accept what Jesus gave them. So just like anyone else, Jewish or non-Jewish, um, if somebody says, no, I will not accept this, I will not believe this, um, Jesus said, you know, that you know, unless you repent, you, you will all die. He was talking to Jews. And, and he, he was telling the Jews over and over again, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have life within you. If you don't eat my flesh and don't drink my blood, you will not have life within you. And some of them, as you know, walked away from him. I don't know what time we're supposed to stop. Is it time? Uh, you got till 3.15. 3.15, okay. So it looks like we have a little over five, five minutes to go, six minutes to go. Um, yeah, so the, the Jews are called to the fulfillment of the covenant just like anyone else is. And God did not forget them or spurn them. He gave it all to them. They just, some of them, many of them have not accepted. Yes, this lady in the sweater. So this Um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, the vision is not outside of time, not in the way that God is outside of time, because time is a creature, so he's not subject to a creature. But the vision is a vision of historical events, so it's an allegorical story that's told with these symbols. And even the term days, you know, how long is a day in this case? Is it a year, or what's the unit? So, um, if I'm understanding your question, um, it's a description of actual things that would happen, but it's told in a way that is symbolic. So, unless you know what the meaning is of those days and other things like that, it would be, it would be hard to say it's definitely this or that. Um, this is also another area where Scott mann has got a lot more information about that than I would on the fly. I think in the bookstore you find some Scott on books. <laughs> I think we may have time for maybe, well, it's like we have five minutes, so. Uh, yes, sir. I was just going to ask, I have an agnostic friend that I work with, just to put in context. He asked me at what point, or why did God bring Jesus at that certain time period? It's like, why not in the night? It's like, why not? Yeah. He's why, his agnostic friend asked him, why, why in the fullness of time did God come to us in Jesus when he could have come earlier or later? Why didn't he come now when we've got the means of mass communication? And everyone everywhere could, could know about this. I don't think any, anyone has the answer to that question. Some people I know have speculated. St. Augustine took that up in the City of God, he talks about that. Um, and so one, one possible solution is that it was, um, it was the appropriate time to do so because of how God had led his people through all the ages before that, through the prophets, or gradually preparing them for the Messiah. Um, and because it was God's, it was the Lord's intention that the church be the means of preaching the gospel. This is why Jesus ascended to heaven. He could have stayed on earth. I mean, he could still be there. Could you imagine if Jesus was still there 2,000 years later, and anyone could go there and hear Jesus speaking? Um, his plan was not to do that personally, but to do it in through the church. So that's why I don't think it would be, you know, any better if he had come now with his TV and vlogs and things like that. Uh, 
because it was the work of the church to do that. Anyway, off the cuff, those are a couple of thoughts that come to mind. Maybe one final question. Yes, and this, this gentleman here has been trying so hard. I'll, I'll throw it to you. Um, well, maybe it's not technical questions or in depth analysis or um, what are the issues, what are the problems of the issues that you have that you have with the Protestants? How can you be the true church when your priests are doing all these terrible things? Yeah, yeah, it's a messy, ugly, terrible problem, and I don't mean to suggest that there's some snappy, you know, just say this and it will solve the problem because it, it's clearly a, a big mess. But you could say, well, Jesus can't pick twelve men, and Judas betrayed Jesus, and then committed suicide. Peter denied Jesus three times, including once under oath. So, I mean, should we really have trusted Jesus or should we really have trusted the apostles because their track record was pretty bad? In fact, that is, you know, so someone help me with the math here. What percentage of 12 is two? It's got to be, what, uh, maybe 8%, something like that? So I think 8% of 12 is bigger than the percentage of priests compared to the total number of priests. So if we just want to go on percentages, Jesus had a worse track record than we have right now, but it didn't invalidate the truth of his message or the truth of those that he sent forward. Um, we, we don't put our faith in the priests or the bishops or the popes of the Catholic Church. We put our faith in Jesus. And all of us are to keep our eyes fixed on him. And this is why it seems to me that there's maybe the best answer to their question is, this is a proof of the church's divine mission and being established by Jesus because, look, 2,000 years have gone by, we've had lots of bad priests, and the church is still here. And it hasn't destroyed itself many times over. I find that a great sign of encouragement. I'll believe it in that. Thank you all very much.